appreciated. And, you know, um, so I'm the new guy. I'm Joe. More about me in a bit. Um, when I came on board, it became clear some of the work that we would normally do to get out into the community and engage with folks is just really difficult to do right now. And so this digital hour is really for the community of Kitsap and the West Sound. Of course, we welcome Washingtonians and beyond from everywhere. But if you have ideas about this digital hour and how to make it really relevant for you, we'd love to hear that. So our goal is to really bring our community together once a month with a couple different topics. We'll probably hear something about economics or the current business climate, something like that, which Thankfully, we have Representative Kilmer here today. Thank you so much for joining us, Representative Kilmer. And then really tools that small businesses can use. And we have three wonderful experts on the topic of digital marketing and business resilience today. Uh, and they'll be speaking at the bottom half of the hour. So the top half of the hour, you know, 10 or 15 minutes of a talk uh, with 10 or 15 minutes of Q&A, a little bit of other things peppered in between. The bottom of the hour, uh, presentations from domain experts and panel interactive opportunities to learn more and get tools you can use to run your business. So who am I and why am I at Kita? Well, Kita is a dream job and I'm really excited to be here. I live in Kitsap. I've lived in Kitsap for the last three years. Prior to that, I worked eight years in entrepreneurial led economic development in Alaska. I'm an Alaska kid. I was born in Anchorage, Alaska. And so I ran essentially the city of Anchorage's economic development fund for eight years. So my background really comes from the startup and innovation side of things and how that affects economic de development. Uh, talking a little bit about where Kita is going, just so everybody knows, your Kitsap Economic Development Alliance for the next 14 months is gonna be focused on dealing with COVID and being here for our community. So nothing fancy, nothing glitzy, but really, we want to know what are the tools that we can deploy to you, the partnerships, programs, and technical assistance that can make your lives as employers, as business professionals, as institutions in the public and private sector, how can we make it better? Because we're all going through something remarkable right now. It's a moment of shared humanity that we haven't seen in 100 years. So what are we doing? We're going to be focused right here on Kitsap. Today, as I said, the top of the hour, we're thankfully joined by Representative Derek Kilmer, who's going to talk a little bit about uh, his coming life post-election, um, his perspective on things, including the potential for stimulus and post-election legislation. And then around 1130, we're going to swing into digital marketing in the age of COVID with Maureen Jan, Eugenie Jones, Lofbridge, and Rihanna Hill all marketing and communications experts specialized in business resiliency and digital marketing. And so with that, I think we're ready to move forward uh, to the first of our speakers. I believe that's what's next. Oh, no, it's not. So calendar us. So we've got some things coming up, December 3rd, January 7th, and February 4th, i.e. the first Thursday of every month. We'll be doing the Kitsap Digital Hour. Please join us for that. And then we'll be moving into our half-day economic forecast, one-of-a-kind digital event held February 18th. Normally, we would get together in Kitsap. You know, I think our top attendance was over 300 people at one of these events. Our economic forecast is, of course, going to be digital in 2021. And join us for that. A um, couple other opportunities. Teresa, do you want to talk about these a little bit? Sure. So um, Global Entrepreneurship Month is a global event, uh, and it focuses all about educating and, and networking for startup businesses. And this month, um, via the state of Washington, Startup Washington, they are taking this online, and they have loads of really valuable um, webinars that are taught by experts from around the state and they are available live and on demand. And then our good friend Maury Foreman has started a new uh, project with the state of Washington Department of Commerce called Entrepreneur Academy. And it's going to be a guided um, set of workshops that are all about assisting uh, new businesses. 
And you can find information on all of those at startup wash at startup choose Washington state.com. And I just want to mention that this slideshow and all the other uh, resources that we talk about today, including a recording of this webinar, will be posted to our website. Ah, I see. I'm muted. I'm so good at that. Has that ever happened? That's happened to like everybody, right? Uh, Teresa, did you want to go ahead and introduce this poll? We're just looking for some demographic questions as to what kinds of folks we're talking to today. Well, unfortunately, the poll isn't being cooperative for me. So maybe could you just type into the, the chat bar, um, tell us who you are and why you're here. Great. Thanks a lot. We will look at that uh, after this event. And so for the next 10 or 15 minutes, we're going to hear from Representative Derek Kilmer, uh, who we can't thank enough for joining us. We know how bu busy he is right now. Things are a little busy uh, on the federal landscape currently. Um, and then we'll go into some Q&A and we'll use the chat for Q&A. So Derek Kilmer, thank you and congratulations. Thanks, Joe. Uh, it's great to be with you. Um, and Joe, welcome to Kita. Uh, we're, we're glad to have you on board. Um, and it's good, uh, good to be here with all of you. Um, before I say anything else, I just actually want to thank Kita. Uh, I think I heard Joe say uh, in his introductory remark that he was here to uh, help serve the community and uh, uh, particularly during this difficult time in the pandemic, make sure we have the backs of our local employers. I feel like that's my job too, but I, I really feel like Kita has done an extraordinary job of that during this difficult time, just doing regular webinars and uh, highlighting opportunities for our local business owners and getting just good and accurate information out to people. And I just wanna say thank you to, to the Kita team for that. You guys have a, a great team and for every person who's on the line who, uh, supports Kita. I want to thank you too. As a guy who worked for Kita's um, sister organization in Pierce County, I always found myself uh, when I worked in economic development before I uh, served in public office, wishing that elected officials would say thank you more to our local employers. And I want to do that too. Uh, for each of you who are contributing to the vitality of our community, um, who are keeping people employed. I just want to say thank you to that. I know this has been a really challenging year and uh, uh, I don't want to um, let the moment pass without just expressing appreciation for every one of you uh, who are, um, who are uh, contributing to our local economy. Joe asked me to give a bit of an update from what's cooking in our nation's capital. Um, it's always dicey to do that within an hour of the lunch hour because um, it's always uh, uh, contributes to stomach upset, but um, I, I think you will very likely see some action on a COVID relief bill. Um, I will say up front, um, I think that is uh, a long time in coming. Frankly, I wanted to see this happen far earlier. I'm thankful you saw an announcement from Senator McConnell yesterday that the Senate would be uh, open to taking up uh, a relief package now that the election is over. Um, that's good news because people need the help. Back in May, you saw the House pass a bill called the HEROES Act to really provide a comprehensive response to the pandemic. Uh, first, to crush this virus, to make the investments in testing and tracing and treatment that are needed to crush this virus and to protect lives. But second, also to protect livelihoods, to provide help for people who've seen the rug pulled out from under them, um, uh, as a consequence of this pandemic, um, uh, food assistance, housing assistance, uh, extended unemployment, uh, another round of the uh, recovery rebates, but also uh, assistance for small businesses. And listen, you know, when, when uh, we passed that in May, uh, the response from the Senate, and I, I don't say this in a partisan way, it's just a statement 
in effect, uh, the, the uh, response from Senate leadership was, well, let's just take a pause. Unfortunately, what we have not seen uh, pause is uh, the pandemic. We see a continued rise in cases. And we have also, what hasn't paused is just the economic pain as a consequence of this pandemic. We continue to see a whole lot of Americans who are unemployed and a whole lot of businesses that are struggling. And I think we need to see action uh, on a relief package. I will tell you, we, I made a decision a few months ago that when someone uh, lost, reached out to my office having lost their job or lost their business because of this pandemic, I'm not sending them a form letter, I'm calling them. And you know, I'm spending several hours a week talking to people who are really hurting. You know, I talked to a woman in Port Angeles a few weeks ago who said, you know, she said, I've worked all of my adult life. She said, I used to organize the food drive for my employer. And she said, for the first time, I actually had to go to the food bank just to feed my family. And I talked to a small business owner a couple of weeks ago uh, who said, you know, I'm, I'm, uh, uh, I've been in business for 30 years. I wanted to pass it on to my kids. He said, I just don't know how we're going to, how to hang on here. And so I think it is really important for the federal government to step up and to pass another relief package. Not only did the House do that in May, it did it again uh, uh, just a few weeks ago in October. Um, you know, that updated version of the HEROES Act was intended to really be a compromise, one that could still deliver the help that's needed to our local employers and to folks who need it, um, but that might actually get across the finish line. And that was, I think, seen as a step forward just in terms of uh, of getting help to folks who need it and hopefully moving us closer to seeing a deal. I hope that happens. I do wanna highlight a few components of that, that um, and then I'll, I'll open it up to questions. The, the, um, I mentioned it included another round of impact payments, uh, continued uh, federal support for unemployment benefits. Importantly, and this has been a point of negotiation and disagreement between the House and the Senate and, and the administration, additional support for state, local, and tribal governments. In the absence of that, you're gonna see uh, a lot of public sector employees get laid off. And the concern that you've heard from economists is that's how this recession becomes a longer term recession or even a depression. Because in the absence of that help, you're gonna see, you know, I, I did a call with a bunch of community college leaders uh, a couple uh, weeks ago, and they've been asked by the state to prepare a budget to cut 15 to 20 percent out of their budget. That would involve a lot of layoffs, and unfortunately that means both the services that they are provide get uh, impacted, but also it means that more and more people in our community are out of work, and that affects the bottom lines of our local businesses. And so part of the rationale pro for providing an emergency support for state, local, and tribal governments is to uh, avert that. Um, I do wanna highlight two things that were in that HEROES Act 2.0 that I think may very likely be in a compromise agreement in part because it will affect all of you on the line. One, I expect that you will see another round of the Paycheck Protection Program. Of the things on which there is agreement and disagreement, there is largely agreement on doing another round of that Paycheck Protection Program. There may be some tweaks to make sure that more assistance is provided to struggling nonprofits and to some of the harder hit businesses um, and to try to target some of that assistance where perhaps it may be most urgently needed. In the House passed bill, <clears throat> there was some targeted assistance for, um, for uh, some sectors of our economy that may just see the pain last a little bit longer. So for example, our restaurants, even if the governor tomorrow turned the dial on reopening, you may not see our local restaurants at the occupancy that they were at, at previously. Same thing with like live venue operators. So you saw in the house passed bill, some directed assistance to that. I am not sure whether that will be in a final package. I do think that another round of the Paycheck Protection Program will be in a final package. I will also mention along the lines of the PPP, there seems to be agreement, though you can't take this to the bank until it's um, uh, the, till the ink is dry on an agreement. There seems to be agreement on uh, uh, expediting and simplifying the forgiveness under the PPP, particularly for the smaller loans, those that are $150,000 or less. Um, the other thing I want to highlight for you, and, and you may want to just start getting smart on this because I think it could be part of a final agreement, and that is uh, something called the Employee Retention Tax Credit. There was a thin version of that included in the CARES Act. I think you will see an enhanced version of that in a comp compromise deal that was certainly true in the HEROES Act 2.0 that the House voted on last month. Um, the idea here is an acknowledgement 
that the best way to deal with unemployment is keep people employed and providing some assistance to our local businesses to do that I think makes a lot of sense. I'm a co-sponsor of a bill that would do that specifically, but I think you might see that as part of a broader package. I'll just mention one other thing, maybe just to preempt the question, because I imagine I might get it. Um, and that is, uh, uh, so far, much of what you've seen out of the federal government has simply been oriented towards trying to stop the bleeding. At some point, I think you may see something that is truly more of a stimulus effort to try to get the economy up off the ground. The, the, um, my sense uh, is that you've heard both Democrats and Republicans in every branch of government, uh, well, at least in the executive and legislative branch of government, say that that might look like a big infrastructure bill. Um, investments in roads and bridges and uh, hopefully and probably expanding that definition to include broadband, um, uh, clean energy and affordable housing as well uh, as a means of putting people to work now and laying the foundation for our economic growth over the long haul. So that is a, a quick scan. I, I would guess that on that infrastructure part of the conversation, that is probably a next year thing. All of that discussion on the uh, on a potential relief deal, I think, is most likely a this year thing, particularly in light of Leader McConnell's comments yesterday. So um, I will pause there. I'm happy to take any questions that folks have. And uh, uh, again, just uh, let me reiterate my gratitude for all of our local employers for doing the important work of keeping people employed. Thank you, Congressman Kilmer. And again, thank you so much for spending time with us today. It means a lot. We've already got a really great question in the chat, one that's near and dear to my heart from Beth Shea about micro entrepreneurship. Um, depending on what kind of business owner you were, it, you, you either had an SBA relationship so you could access PPP and IDLE, uh, or maybe you were more of a solo entrepreneur or a micro entrepreneur, just one to five employees. Uh, any thoughts on addressing that potentially through legislation. Yeah, the HEROES Act 2.0 that the House passed actually included some provisions trying to extend uh, assistance to um, folks who might have been left out of the first uh, wave of support through the CARES Act. Uh, as you mentioned, the Paycheck Protection Program, if you were a micro enterprise that might not have had a traditional banking relationship or have, having done anything with the Small Business Administration uh, previously, that you know, that was complicated. And so part of, uh, part of the um, uh, policy approach in the HEROES Act was to extend some additional support to micro enterprises. I would also add to um, some of the uh, minority owned businesses were unfortunately disproportionately uh, underrepresented in that, that first wave of PPP and idle assistance. And so there was some uh, attempt to address that. I'll mention just a couple other quick things. The, um, you already saw some emphasis on providing additional resources to community-based lenders, in part because they are more likely to have that relationship with microenterprises. And then finally, I'm a sponsor on a bill that would um, kind of replicate the rebate checks, but for microenterprises to provide some grant-based aid to microenterprises, to, to, and not just to microenterprises, but to kind of small Main Street businesses um, that have had a real challenge uh, over these last uh, eight months. We have another question from a uh, past president of KEDA, Monica Blackwood. She asks about the employer tax credit. Um, keeping employees in jobs, will employers who had previous PPP loans be eligible to access that tax credit as long as it didn't cross funding time frames? Pretty, pretty technical, but what, what are your thoughts? As it was written in the HEROES Act, the answer is yes. You know, what, what, um, how that lays out um, once there is an agreement uh, remains to be seen, right? That, uh, so, you know, right now, um, you know, so there's two things at play. If there is an agreement, I think you will see another round of PPP and I think you will see an expansion of the employer retention tax credit. But until there's a deal, unfortunately, you can't take that to the bank. So um, my commitment to you is I would be more than happy, uh, hopefully when there is a deal, not if there is a deal, uh, to come back and do a full um, uh, overview of what's actually in it and uh, respond to any technical questions from there. You know, uh, Congressman Kilmer, I wanted to ask something. Um, as I've moved into this role, I've been taking meetings with our community 
And something that's come up a little bit and probably not enough is the impact of school closures on families and the sort of the economic implications of that, whether you're working, whether you're running a business, whether you're capable of remote work or not, this is a pretty big economic experiment to have children across the nation learning from home. This isn't a statement politically, but I'm interested um, what kind of response or economic approaches might there be from a legislative perspective to minimize some of those challenges? Because this is really one of the more interesting economic questions of our age. How can you work if you have to monitor your child's education? Yeah, this has been really challenging, not just for local employers, but um, for our kiddos too. I say that with a sixth grader and a ninth grader who are in school um, right above me, which is why my Wi-Fi might be slightly unstable. Um, but it's been this has been a real tough year. I mean, and, and I think there are real concerns about you know both, both the the um, education that our kids are getting and and you know certainly the social emotional growth and in terms of making it harder for them to um, interact with their uh, uh, with their kiddos, not to mention the challenge for parents. Um, you know, what that means in terms of being able to go to work, uh, challenges around childcare. So what do we do about it? One, we got to crush this virus. I mean, th th that is, th that is one of the things that has held up the ability to, to, um, get kids back into the classroom, to get, uh, workers back into the job. And the HEROES Act takes a pretty aggressive approach to that, to dramatically ramp up investments in testing, tracing, treatment, to, tr to work to crush this virus um, so that we can feel comfortable. I mean, the, the, the nations that have gotten a handle on this and have been able to more aggressively open up, the way they've done that is you got to know who's sick. That's why testing is important. And public health experts say that as a nation, we should be doing about a five to 6 million, actually they say five to 10 million tests per day. Right now, we I think we are at about 900,000 tests per day as a nation. So we need to do dramatically more of that. One, so we know who's got it. The idea then is to um, isolate folks who are, are sick. So they're not going into the workplace or going into school and getting more people sick. Doing that contact tracing is a means of identifying who a sick person who has been in touch with. So those folks can either quarantine or go get tested um, as a means of stopping the spread of this virus. The second component of this is making sure that our school districts have the resources that they need. That is included in the HEROES Act so that either if they're opening in person or virtually that they have the resources necessary to make sure that our kids are getting a good education. Um, in terms of in-person instruction, I've talked to a lot of superintendents they're looking at substantial costs associated with in-person instruction, you know, bringing on additional janitorial staff, having personal protective equipment for um, both uh, uh, staff and students. Um, and all of that comes with a price tag attached to it. And so the HEROES Act sought to make sure that those resources were made available. And then the third component of this is childcare. Unfortunately, we've seen a lot of uh, childcare providers um, uh, go out of business during this. The House has passed two bills to try to address that. One is called the Child Care is Essential Act to provide grant funding to child care providers to try to stabilize that sector, make sure that they have the resources necessary to safely reopen and continue operating. And then the other one is some, something called the Child Care for Economic Recovery Act, which is not just focused on the child care providers, they're focused on working families so that working families can afford to, to um, to pay for their kids to go to childcare so that they can go back into the uh, to the workplace. I think both of those are really important. That was included in the HEROES Act and uh, I hope will be included in any sort of final COVID relief bill. And I think the answer that I just gave also respond, somewhat responds to the concerns that Maureen raised in the chat, which is, you know, if we can, if we can get, get, get our students back into the classroom, back into a childcare setting, uh, you know, that is not just good for our kids, it's good for working parents. I think that the conventional wisdom is, yes, we, we all expect more funding to come um, from the federal government. This is just a remarkable black swan event and more, more stimulus and or life-saving is needed. What is, given the landscape, what's the over-under on timing? 
and I, I, I mean, this is, this is sensitivity analysis, right? Low, medium, high. What are your thoughts and forecasts for when we might see something? Um, if, I were, if I were laying odds in Vegas, uh, I would bet you see a relief package pass in the lame duck, uh, which means, you know, the House is back in next week um, uh, and the Senate, uh, I think, uh, as well. Uh, I think the stars are aligned for an agreement. And I say that in part because, you know, the, the, there's still not white smoke coming out of the Capitol to tell you what the election results are going to be in terms of the presidency. So I'm not making any comments on that. What I will tell you is, I think it is in the interest of the House, the Senate, and the executive to see something get done this year before the holidays. You heard Leader McConnell say that yesterday that he wants to get it done in part because people, you know, we've been, I've been saying this since before May when we passed the HEROES Act initially, people are hurting and they can't wait um, and they shouldn't have to wait any longer than they already have. And so I think that is, that is very, very important. Uh, if there is a new president, I think there's going to be a real effort to clear the decks for that president as much as possible, to get as much wrapped up in terms of support out the door, to get hopefully a full year spending agreement rather than just what's called a continuing resolution where Congress kicks the can on a, on, on government uh, uh, on a government spending de deal. All of those things, I think the incentives are aligned to see something get done. Uh, if I were, if I again, if I were betting, uh, you know, before Thanksgiving may be aggressive. Um, the government runs out of money uh, on, I think it's December 11th. Um, so there, there has to be a spending bill passed by then. You could see those the uh, COVID relief and a spending bill align from a timing standpoint. I hope it happens sooner than that, because again, I'm having conversations on a daily basis with employers that are really struggling and with people who are really hurting. It, it is remarkable the effect this has had on our community and people. We're seeing it as we evaluate uh, businesses for grants and the multiple grant opportunities that have existed through COVID. Um, and, you know, you're just really seeing the impact. And in some ways, that capital that was placed in the CARES Act is just still filtering through the system, but we're on the bottom end of the curve. Uh, a note from Tamara. Uh, on challenges of how the federal poverty level is calculated. There's a link there. Final question from Karina Wood related to COVID and pivoting and reinvention and workforce training. What might be done in this new world, the world we're in currently and the world will be in after COVID uh, to help people um, find relevant work and reinvent themselves? Yeah. Uh, great question. Let me um, let, let me touch on Tamara's point real quick. Unfortunately, you've seen millions of Americans fall into poverty as a consequence of this pandemic. And so, and again, this has been one of the holdups. Part of the approach that was laid out in the House was to expand the child tax credit and the um, earned income tax credit, which are two very powerful components of the tax code that, Im that can immediately lift people out of poverty. One that makes work pay, another that just puts money directly in the pockets of, of uh, families that may have fallen into poverty as a consequence of this pandemic. I think that's really important. To Karina's question, I, I, it is one of the biggest threats uh, as a consequence of this pandemic is not just that people are out of work, but they may have to be out of work for a long period of time. So you heard the chairman of the Fed uh, identify this as one of the biggest risks. He, he referred to skills erosion uh, as a real threat. So we got to make sure that workers who were displaced as a consequence of this can um, find a job that can be can continue to be product, productive members of our workforce. And so we introduced, I introduced a bill called the Skills Renewal Act. Uh, it is bipartisan in the House and in the Senate to provide basically a training tax credit for folks who've lost their jobs so that they're able to um, get upskilled and rather than be victims of this uh, economic, uh, uh, these economically challenging times that they can be empowered to navigate that. It could be used for a wide range of training programs. I think that's the type of thing that uh, you could see um, uh, pass um, if not out of this relief package, um, hopefully early into the new year. I appreciate the question, Karina. 
Thank you, Congressman Kilmer. More questions came in. We will get these to your office Great. and respond to our attendees. Uh, thank you so much for being generous with your time. We appreciate it. And uh, thank you for your service. You bet. Stay safe, everybody. Thanks again, Keita. Cheers. So we're going to turn things back over to Teresa Mangrum to uh, introduce our next session of panelists and presenters. And here we go, Teresa, thank you so much. Okay, well, first up today, we are going to hear from Eugenie jones Laveridge, who works for Kitsap County in the marketing uh, uh, division and she has lots of great information and strategies to share with us. So I'm going to release the screen for Eugenie. Welcome. Hello, Teresa. Thank you so much. Uh, let me just pull this up. See that I am sharing just one moment. So can, I read, can you see my screen? Can someone tell me <laughs> if you can see the screen or not? Uh, it's, it's starting. Okay. There you Thanks, go. Ma Thanks, Maureen. So my name is Eugenie jones Lawfridge. Um, I have a career steeped in marketing communications. Most the last year I've been with uh, Kitsap County's Department of Community Development, work with a great team there, and I am the marketing communications program lead, leading a team of fellow marketers who help to facilitate marketing communications work for the Department of Community Development. I'm very happy to be here and share some thoughts with you. I have to say that one of the most difficult aspects of being here today was trying to uh, share comments within a five minute time frame because the world of digital marketing is immense and how can I help, help people in five minutes? And so. I, I'm going back uh, thinking that in terms of whatever else you can do, it is foundationally built up on your ability to communicate with your customers. And so I'd like to share some information in regards to that line of communication. There's opportunities for a lot of different avenues of communication, but one of the most direct lines of communication is through email marketing. Um, it enables you to send messaging directly to the person that you're trying to communicate with it enables you to establish a relationship with that person, to build a rapport with them, to get to know them. And it also helps drive business to your organization as well. So I'd like to share some ideas about the concepts of email marketing with you. Um, first and foremost is you need to constantly be in a mode of collecting names and email addresses for your email messaging. Um, and I would suggest setting up um, a database system for collecting first and last names and the email address so that when you send out your email marketing communications, you're able to use that person's first name. It'll automatically be generated within, within the template of your document and it'll say a, a greeting will come to them saying, hello, Eugenie, hello, Maureen, hello, Joe, rather than, hey, you, check out my information on my business. So collect names and always be collecting names. Every time you communicate in any messaging, website, direct, in your store, online, always be collecting. That's what the ABC is there for, to remind you to continually collect names. Even if you have a, a robust Facebook environment or other social media, those mediums do not allow you to speak directly, one mano a mano to your client or your customer. So always be collecting names first. Secondly, message them regularly and share information that's in the context of a relationship, not just about, hey, come in and buy something. Share something of interest to them and talk about your business in the, in, as well as when you're sharing this information of interest to them. And as you're creating messages that are interesting, one of the most important things is knowing who you're talking to. So in order to know who you're talking to, take opportunity to collect information about your customer whenever you can. If you're a restaurant and you have a card on your table at the, at the end of the meal where they're signing their check, ask them to answer a few questions too. And you can get to know your customer over time, get to know what their likes and their dislikes are, 
and be able to tailor your messaging more directly to what their interests are. When you're, when you're sending out messages, make sure your brain is focused on customer-centric messaging, that you are speaking from the perspective of what is of interest to them, what would be helpful to them, how can I get their attention within this very short window of opportunity and keep it in order to get my message across. So you're being very focused on what the customer would be interested in, what they would want to listen to, and what would be appealing to their eye for them to even pay any attention to what you're saying. Finally, in that messaging, make sure that you're addressing how your business is responding to the threat of COVID. Whatever procedures you are doing, make them a part of your messaging. I'm sure we've all seen commercials on TV that are doing this right now. A Stanley Steamer comes to mind. They talk about their uh, service people wearing masks and um, making sure that they're cleaning the area and wiping down surfaces, et cetera, et cetera. Whatever the case may be, make sure that you're including that messaging about COVID in your communication as well so that people feel safe in knowing that you're taking every precaution that's necessary to invite them into your business that they're not going to feel jeopardized. One thing that's happening a lot lately is we're seeing people more and more taking pictures of reporting restaurants and other businesses that are not applying COVID guidelines in those businesses. So don't be one of those businesses. Don't get negative publicity attached to your organization. After you've collected names, after, after you've targeted messaging that's customer centric, and after you've reached out, Access, access what's basically what you've done, assessing it to see how effective was it, how much response did I get back, and how can I be better the next time I send this message. One way that you can assess how effective you've been is to direct your message back to a central spot that allows you to be able to tabulate who responded. If you have them go back to your website and you're monitoring your website um, views, then you can see after I released this messaging, my views went up by 50%. Then I know that this was an effective way for me to message. Or after I released this messaging, there were no changes in my website traffic. So that wasn't a great opportunity for me or a great outlet for me in terms of utilizing that messaging medium. So collect, message, engage, assess, and then repeat, repeat, repeat. I finally just wanted to say something about beyond the day to day, every day, do all that you can to take care of yourself. Um, you know the expression, steel sharpens steel. Surround yourself with people who are positive and smart and engaging and are go-getters that are going to encourage you to do the same. And make sure that you're taking care of yourself, mind, body, and spirit, because foundationally you need to be well in order to do the things that you want to do. And then constantly evaluating to see how you're doing and how you could be better. So I think I was pretty close to five minutes, but I see um, Kathy on screen. So maybe that's my cue that I need to move on and get that. <laughs> so thank you very much. I'll share some resources in the chat window for you to uh, look at further. Thank you so much for that great intro on this topic. We're excited about these three professionals that agreed to share their insights and knowledge with us today. And next up is Maureen Jan. Um, I've already forgotten the name of your second company, Neo Lux Marketing, but forgive me. I'm sure yeah, Spark Commons. <laughs> <laughs> um, so Maureen, the screen is yours. Fabulous. Um, so I'm Maureen Jan. I'm a local business owner here in Kitsap. I own both a co-working space and I uh, also own a marketing organization. So I, I've had a variety of experience and I've also been a chronic uh, entrepreneur and uh, a, a professional marketer. It's been part of uh, my DNA and I've been doing it off and on for about 20 years. Uh, what I wanted to talk to you is about today is a little, is sort of a deeper dive into what Eugenie was talking about um, with a focus on strategy. So um, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen for just a few minutes. We're gonna look at the, um, the slides so that you have some points, but I've also included hopefully what I consider a helpful blog that I wrote so that you don't have to take notes because uh, I'm a chronic fast talker and I would hate for anybody to miss anything. So hang on just a second. I'm gonna go ahead and share that in the chat for everybody. So uh, go ahead and take a look at this when you get a chance. But for now, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and uh, take you to my slides. Oh. 
Hmm, maybe I'm taking you to my slides. Maybe Zoom is giving me a bad time. Okay. So today, what I'm going to talk about is these three points. Much like what uh, Eugenie had, we have a, a you know you have to think about these from a, uh, an infrastructure standpoint, so you don't drive yourself crazy. So today, I'm talking about how to prioritize, how to connect, and how to collect. So I'm going to go ahead and swap over and just stop sharing, and then you get to see my smiling face while we chat. So, excuse me. All right, so today's marketing environment is really tricky. So many local organizations are, rely on the in-person connections to build new business. And since the pandemic has hit, that's really been stripped away. Now we're left without how to digitally re represent ourselves um, and how we show up on Zoom calls. So the question really is, is how do we proactively grow or recover our business using only a digital footprint? Well, the first thing I can recommend is prioritizing much to what Eugenie was talking about, knowing your audience is key. So you need to prioritize the market that you're going to, that brings you the most money, strategically helps grow your business for long-term health, and those people who will refer and advocate for you, for you to, uh, to grow trust in the market. So if you don't carefully consider or prioritize who the people you're gonna go after, then you're gonna fall into this whole marketing to everyone concept, when in fact, marketing to everyone is marketing to no one. You have to make real connections in order to fully uh, engage with your ideal customers. So how do you do that? Well, I say you look back at customer data. Um, you ask yourself, who, is my, who was my most profitable customer in the past? What have they purchased from me? How has their life changed since the pandemic? And what would be useful to them now? So when you remember, when you go through this process and you start um, you know, working out who these ideal customers are, uh, you, you wanna take this as sort of a first draft because in reality, everything's changing and you'll need to revisit these every couple of months depending on the you know, social uh, unrest, the pandemic state or uh, the political, the unstable political environment. So all of these things change these people's lives and it will change the way they interact with your company. So now you know who the right people to start with are. That's great. So let's start speaking their language. When you are connecting with them, you want to find a critical way to connect emotionally uh, with those prioritized customers. They need to feel your passion for your product or service as well as your desire to help them. This is where being genuine and vulnerable comes into play. Spend some time thinking about and jotting down notes about why you got into this business in the first place and how you can serve your customers during a difficult time. And I often push people to their website because the website is the one is, is one of those digital properties you can 100% own. And so if that's the case, then you can create a page that highlights or, or that's specifically geared for each of those customer profiles that you're, you're, you're thinking back on. So here are the key elements you wanna include on each of those pages. You wanna talk about what the, do they specifically do for you, how that helps you solve their problem, answer any questions that you see happening in that sales process, talk about proof points, you know, you want to show them that you can walk the talk and that you're not full of it, and then a clear call to action. How do you help them advance to the next stage of the buying cycle? And remember, you have to give this time. This is a relationship with the customers, much like what Eugenie said, it's, it's a long-term relationship, and you want to, and marketing's goal is to tee up engaged, excited customers to your sales team or in your sales process and much like fine wine, you can't rush that. So the final stage is about collection. Uh, if you're a small business owner like me, it's really, for me, I focus on money. And so I ask myself the question every day, what's closest to the money? And in some cases that looks like putting energy into deals that are about to close, or for other people, it might look like seasonal buying trends that drive people to your business. And if you ask yourself, where's the money or what's closest to the money using these types of filters, then you know where to prioritize your own energy so that you can collect the maximum amount of money for your, for your day. So then you ask yourself, what data have I collected to make sure I have the right customers, right? So now we've, we've outlined who that customer is. We've gone through the process of actually engaging with them. And now we wanna make sure that what we thought in initially is now right. So just to wrap this up, Facing a new market, we're all facing a new market. Even if our customers are, are, are the same, they're unfortunately different from months of quarantine, civil unrest, and unstable political situations. 
that's, and so what we need to do is help them navigate this new environment authentically and without being exploitative, using the products, using our own products and services as part of the serve a solution that's gonna make their life better. That's how you build trust in a world where consumers have had their heart broken too many times by organizations who didn't really care enough to speak directly to them. That's it for me. Okay, thank you. More great info. And as you can see, we're, we're building um, you know, up a little bit leveling as each of the speakers shares their expertise. So thank you, Maureen. Um, our um, third speaker um, is Rihanna Hill with Pancake Digital Solutions. I actually looked it up. I always try to transpose Pancake and Digital in my brain. It's just scrambled. So I think I got it right. Um, and Rihanna is going to share with us on a specific um, focus for your digital marketing. So thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, Kathy, and uh, really an honor to follow up two wonderful speakers here um, for this panelist. Well, several wonderful speakers that we've listened to today. So I'll go ahead and share what I've got, present this so it looks a little bit more professional while it loads. Okay, so yes, so to kind of build off of what we've talked about from the last two panelists, is now that you know all of these things, how do you implement that? What do you do? And I want to really sort of drive home that taking action is better than being perfect, especially in a situation like this where you need to be adaptable and you don't know what things are gonna be like next month. You don't know what things are gonna be like next year for your business. If you can have your doors open, if you need to figure out how to sell something online uh, or if you need to figure out how to set up you know, virtual services. So taking action is, is much better than having it be perfect. You can perfect it down the road, like Maureen was saying, with data. Oh, and hi, I'm Brianna M. Hill. Uh, if you want to look me up, um, I'm on LinkedIn. You can see uh, a little bit more about what I do. But um, so basically, when, how do you take this action? What do you do? Well, we live in an information age. You can find anything online with a quick Google search. You can learn how to do anything with a YouTube tube search. It's all there um, and much more than I can teach you in a, a quick little five minute uh, spiel after you've been watching Zoom for the past hour. But if there's anything you take away from this, I really wanna encourage you is just pick one thing, pick something that you can do that you can implement right away. And you know, to follow up with what everyone else has said, figure out who your customer is and where they are. You know, are they scrolling through Facebook at night looking at pictures of their grandkids? Are they connecting with their friends on Instagram um, to follow up with those things? Are they reading their emails because they're following up with uh, work related things? Find that one thing, look up how to do it and implement it in a way that focuses on the revenue for your business. So if you have a store front and suddenly you can't sell anything from your storefront anymore because people can't visit, how can you make that up online? Do you have one thing that's very inexpensive to ship that you could sell online, for example, and focus on that. And once you've built up enough revenue from that, then you can hire somebody else to do the rest. Uh, because one of the things that I've seen a lot of business owners really struggle with, especially when you have to make changes all the time, is trying to do all the things. And many small business owners, um, myself included, having run a business um, and stepping away from that now, is when you try to do way too much at once. Um, so focusing on what's really important. And right now, a lot of that is, you know, what's the one thing that you can, you can do right now? And um, as far as hiring out goes, I know that's a really popular thing you want to outsource, and it seems like that could be a big, big bear to get to. But, you know, think about like a restaurant. If the owner is also the chef and the host and the manager, how long is that going to work? So think about, you know, what's the most important thing? So for, the, for a restaurant, that's probably the chef making the food until they can hire another chef. And finally, just remember that 
if you're just getting started and putting a toe in for the digital world, it really is just a reflection on real life. Oh, we've got some chats, I'll stop sharing. Um, digital is really just a reflection of real life. Everything that's online is who we are in, in the space. You know, you could look at LinkedIn as like a chamber of commerce meeting or Twitter as a cocktail party or, um, you know, email marketing as some version of being able to have a conversation with people. And we can really see that now Zoom meetings are taking the place of in-person meetings. So have fun with it. Don't be intimidated by it. And just focus on the one thing that you can do. Google it, figure it out, watch YouTube videos, focus on that one thing that will help your business have revenue so that you can pay your employees and pay your sources and go from there. So that's uh, that's big takeaways. Okay, thanks um, guys, gals. Um, and I'm waiting for folks to, I know you guys have questions, so please post them in comment. And these uh, three professionals have offered to do a deeper dive workshop for us. And we had hoped to do a poll, but of course it's not being cooperative. So maybe you guys could just raise your hands um, in the um, participant section so that we can know what, how many people would be interested in that and that would give us an idea. So yeah, just raise your hand if this is something you would be interested in. We're thinking a two to three hour time block with built-in breaks, of course. And again, they have this was their idea. They all offered because they feel it's important to help the um, small businesses in our community. So we're thankful to them for that. Um, so do I, I have just, any questions? Um, I just wanted to pick up on that too, Kathy, um, to say that uh, Rihanna and Maureen and I, when we loved the opportunity to be here and, and share ideas with you, but we don't even begin to think that this is enough to get you to where you want to be. And as we were discussing this, it came to us quickly that it would be better to be able to have a deeper dive and to be able to do that and to be helpful to businesses in our community. So um, if you're open and amenable to that idea, we encourage you to do it. We would like to do that as a service to our community. Okay, so I see uh, 12 folks that had said they'd be willing. So um, I'm sure some maybe are not finding what they need to do to say so. And we'll be following up with an email to attendees as well to gauge more and then follow up with any plans that are made and timelines, et cetera. So do we have questions for folks? Because I know it was fast. Okay. What is the alternative to Facebook for small business advertising or is there one? Sure, I can take this one um, because Facebook advertising is my area of expertise and there are alternatives such as Google advertising or paper marketing or organic marketing. However, the reason that Facebook has become so popular is because you get the most bang for your buck, quite honestly. Um, it's, it's the cheapest way to get traffic, to get those views. So, you know, if you want an alternative, maybe uh, like Google AdWords, if you're looking for advertising specifically, but again, that's one you'd want to focus on your objectives, who you want to reach and why with what for. Thank you. And from a strategy standpoint, I would add that um, we use Facebook advertising quite a bit to like drive people to uh, content like that it's critical to answer questions for people uh, that are in the funnel. So, um, it, it, but it allows you to do it based on interests, not just demographics, which I just love. Instagram and Facebook use the same engine. So that's nice. And you can sort of uh, singular like duplicate your efforts or you don't have to duplicate your efforts. Okay, uh, how can Twitter be a cocktail party? I, I think Eugenie so, had something to add there. Oh, sorry, yes. Eugenie. <laughs> um, I was just going to say, don't put all your eggs in one basket and to make sure that you're doing analysis of the feedback that you're receiving. Depending upon what your type of business is, Facebook may work for you, but then again, maybe it doesn't. So make sure that you're doing that circle of evaluation. Sh shoot it out there 
see what the response is. If it's not favorable, try something alternatively. Don't put all your eggs in one basket. Oh, and I just wanna mention that the link that I, sh I shared is a website called HubSpot and I'm putting it up again. It's a great DIY site that Rihanna was talking about. That we live in an information age. They have a, a lot of great blogs and information about uh, various marketing techniques that you can utilize as a small business. And I recommend that you check them out. Okay. Um, and I'm sure there's a lot of this that would be in this deeper dive that we've talked about the workshop, you know, like how to evaluate which one to start with. So as Rihanna said, don't try to do it all at once. Um, so here's one for each of you. What new forms of digital marketing are you most excited about? Um, well, I mean, I, TikTok is doing some really interesting things and they've released their advertising platform as well. So you can, uh, a lot of businesses who target the younger demographic can uh, take advantage of that massive audience. Um, of course, that comes with some privacy questions. So, uh, you know, be wary and know, you know, take a calculated risk, but, um, and, and I haven't personally used their advertising platform, but from what I understand, it's very similar to Facebook so that you're able to target based on some behavioral and some um, uh, interest base. So it, it's, I imagine that if that is where your market is, it's very effective. However, I've also seen Instagram go crazy. Like I know everybody does Instagram already. I was newer to Instagram because I didn't get it as fast, but I'm definitely seeing how you can do, especially as businesses do those micro insights like actually like flip books and things like that that sort of distill big concepts down to two bullet points be an incredibly effective uh, use of uh, you know that that platform so and I think it depends too upon what the message is mm -hmm. if you're just trying to give a little short incentive for someone to do something then maybe a Facebook ad is good or maybe you're just trying to draw people into another location for a deeper dive into who you are as an organization. And so depending upon what the motivation is behind your advertising, certain platforms are better suited than others. And also depending upon who your audience is. So it, the long and short of it is, is if there's no right answer. <laughs> it depends is our favorite answer. Exactly, it depends. Rihanna, did you have anything to add? Uh, I'm nodding my head in agreement. You know, that's always true. That's the, the most annoying thing in digital marketing is it in any kind of marketing, but it becomes especially true with digital marketing, which is basically just a magnifying glass on, on regular marketing is that it depends. All right. It depends. And I'm going to turn knowing it, knowing yeah. the market and the clients. Yes. So Joe, I'm turning it back to you. Well, and, and before, first of all, thanks to these amazing panelists. Before we close it out, Kathy Kokus, thank you for taking us through this and thank you for your management of the Q&A. Uh, I wanted to ask Teresa Mangrum, any final thought before I close this thing out? No, no final thoughts, but some messages. So just to, to uh, reassure everyone, all of these uh, resources, the links that you've posted into chat and the... Uh, uh, video of this event, as well as any slides, will be shared to our website. The easiest way for me to do that, of course, beyond sharing to our website, is to email you as a follow-up to this particular webinar. So I'll be doing that, and I'm going to send a, um, a link to encourage you to sign up for our newsletter. In case you aren't, you should be. Um, we try not to spam you too much with lots of emails, but um, we want you to know about what's happening. Uh, and that goes as far, that extends to new opportunities in terms of grants and programs that can assist small businesses now. So, so be looking for that email from me. Perfect. Thank you so much. Uh, Teresa, Kathy, I'm going to say this tomorrow too, but I just want to say thank you for welcoming me into this organization. It's great working with you. I'm having so much fun. To all our panelists today, thank you for joining us and supporting your community. I do have an ask of all attendees. So this is something from the startup world. What's your ask, right? And my ask and Keita's ask is this. We want you to get involved with us. 
So we saw 12 hands go up about, we wanna be involved in a three to four hour um, marketing deep dive, get involved, email us, tell us you want that. If you're interested in tech, defense, entrepreneurship, get involved, we want that. Thank you so much. We will see you next month. Thanks all. Bye-bye.